open with um, an actual speaker um, who's Jonathan Neal, who some of you may know from his several right, uh, interesting books. Um, but he's here to speak from the Campaign Against Climate Change. So, Jonathan, could you kick off for us, please? Okay. Um, first, before I get to the meat of the talk on climate jobs, um, a bit of news. Uh, those of you who read The Guardian will have noticed that the Metropolitan Police and Westminster Council mm. told us in the Campaign Against Climate Change that we um, and many other organizations after us would have to pay for the traffic control and police and our demonstration. We had a meeting two weeks ago at which um, uh, a whole raft of organizations who staged major demonstrations um, all agreed that we would not pay. Not that we protested it, but that we simply would not. Including Palestine Solidarity, Friends of the Earth, People's Assembly, the organizers of this uh, demonstration, uh, Stop the War, um, and CND. Um, and we had a meeting with the police and Westminster and Camden Councils yesterday, um, and we have one completely on this. Ooh, hey. We hope that the movement after us will That's be able to hold on to this. That's Solidarity works. Um, the second thing to say is that do come on the demonstration on the 7th. Um, you can come in one of two ways. Um, one way is we have a, which is the most obvious way, is we have a trade union and anti-austerity block for which Friends of the Earth is loaning us 200 green hard hats. <laughs> so <laughs> if you come in time, you get a hard hat. But there is also, um, it's worth mentioning to people of our age, a uh, grandparents' climate action. Um, uh, group as well. Grandparents Climate Action is open to not simply the people who are grandparents dead, but to anybody who cares about the future and what's going to happen to the next generations. Um, okay. What I want to talk about, though, is what the problem is and what the solutions are. I'll start with the problem because I think I think people don't get the full scale of what is going to happen. Uh, I'm assuming you know quite a bit about the science of climate change. Most people do now. Um, but I think the thing that people, and large numbers of people like you will also know that we're facing, at some point in the future, we're facing a series of feedback effects, which will intensify each other and which will speed the process along very quickly. Um, we don't know at what point that will happen, and we don't know what the key feedback effect will be. But we do know that it will happen because in previous geological time, the records we have say that when the climate is naturally cooling, it cools steadily, but when the climate is warming, it warms over a very long period, and then suddenly it accelerates. Um, there's dispute as to why. We also know that all of the, all of the um, feedback effects that scientists have posited might be happening that they have then gone and looked for, it turns out are already happening. So we face at some point uh, a tipping point, uh, a quantum jump. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that climate change will take place in the political and economic system um, we, we live in globally. Um, in the campaign against climate change, we're a very broad church with people of an enormous variety of uh, politics, but this is a trade union movement, so the name of that system is capitalism. Um, in that system, that system turns natural disasters into human catastrophes. It will do it in several important ways. First of all, the rains will fail in many places. In many places, the rains will come very heavily, but at the wrong time, uh, and very intensively, leading to a great deal of flooding, but no crops. The result will be that in many places, the, the, the crops will be much worse, and in those places, there will be famine. The second thing that will happen is very large numbers of refugees from the uh, various disasters that are going to happen. Um, and those refugees, the 
they'll come up against borders patrolled by men and women with machine guns, and the refugee camps will, the tents will stretch for miles, and they will last for many years. Um, and they'll be accompanied by an intensification of racism on the other side of the border to justify keeping those people out. Now, often, they will, these will be entirely new racisms. It will have to be explained to us what is wrong with the Dutch. Um, but um, that will happen. The third thing that will happen is war. Because if you change the econ if you change the geographical balance of power, the great powers and the small powers will go to war to restore that balance. Finally, the other thing that will happen will be uh, a very strong shift to authoritarian government and austerity. Um, when we hit a crisis, the uh, uh, the powers that be, they will come in with the tanks and the machine guns and they will sound very green. They will be talking about the necessity for all of us to sacrifice. But in fact, only some people will sacrifice and that will be enforced with the tanks and the torture. All of that is waiting for us. And if you, if you want to see what that looks like, you don't have to read a science fiction book. Look at Darfur. Look at Chad. Um, look at Kordofan in Sudan, look at Somalia. Look, the rains failed in that part of the world because of climate change in 1969. And people, uh, and they have not come back. Some years are worse, some years are better, but the rains have not come back. Um, people held it together as best they could until the 1980s at which point they began, because they had many, many ties together, at which point they began killing each other. Um, and you can see the, refu the mass refugees, the starvation, the war, all going together. I mean, the, what's happening in Darfur, Chad, is extremely complicated politically, extremely complicated, many outside countries, but at base, farmers and herders are killing each other for disappearing. That in different forms is what we will face, and we will also face it in the face of enormous economic dislocation, an enormous loss of value and property. Um, the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans was a small hurricane. It was a, a Category 2 hurricane, the biggest ones at the moment are Category 5. Uh, we will see sixes and sevens. Hurricanes are moving north and south. But Katrina, with a Category 2 hurricane, the hurricane surge, which is a tsunami, it's a wave like a tsunami, was 28 feet tall, high, which is 9 meters high when it hit the coast of Louisiana. Um, if you think what a 15, 20 meter tsunami would do to Shanghai or to New York or to Havana, you can see the scale of economic destruction as well. Okay. That's what we face, and what that will mean, in the nature of things, we cannot predict it, how many people will die. It could be, we can say hundreds of thousands, more than in the worst event of the 20th century, the Second World War, certainly, but the scale of it, it's a guess. We also know, it doesn't mean humanity will cease, or society will cease, humanity will continue. Many of the species won't, we will. Um, but um, perhaps the most important thing will be what people have to do and what they have to witness in, as they survive that time. We don't know the time of this. Um, we may have 40 or 50 years. We may have 5 or 10 years. A guess is 20 years, but it's a guess. So, some of us, you know, we may or may not be here when it happens, but for most of the people in the room, somebody you love will be here when it happens. That's what we're facing. It's very serious. The good news is, we can stop it. <laughs> we can stop it happening, and we can do it. That's the calculations in this booklet, this One Minute Climate Jobs booklet, is produced by a coalition of the campaign against climate change, seven unions, including our union, UCU, and the National Union of Students. 
Um, and it's, um, there's this, and behind it, which I dearly wish somebody in the world would read, is 35,000 words of heavily nerdy technical notes, <laughs> which you can download from the Campaign Against Climate Change website. Um, and I spent a lot of my life editing them. Um, but basically, the argument is this, and we're, we're convinced of it. We've done the work now over several years. We've done the research work, and we've got, brought a lot of experts in, and we're convinced it works. What we need to do, I'll start with this country, but what we need to do, it's pretty much the same, same with variations the rest of the world. What we need to do to stop climate change, um, there are thousands of things we need to do, thousands. But three of them will make most of the difference because they'll reduce 90% of the carbon dioxide that goes into the air. One of them is to insulate and rehab all of the houses, all of the public buildings, all of the private, but all of the buildings in the country to reduce the energy use by about half. The second one is to a massive switch from uh, uh, from cars um, and lorries to public transport and to rail. Um, the third one is a massive switch to renewable electricity so that everything is run on renewable electricity. Not simply, um, uh, not, uh, not only what we use electricity for now, but using electricity for all the heating of houses as well, using it for the remaining cars, for all the public transport, and so on. A massive switch to renewable electricity. If globally, this will be mainly uh, solar power and wind power. In Britain, it will be mainly wind power because we are blessed with terrible weather. <laughs> and of the three great resources of renewable energy in Europe, one of them is North Sea wind. Um, the others are Siberian wind and Turkish wind and sun. Um, so, but we need a balance. We'll need a balance of many different kinds of renewable energy because no one form of renewable energy is steady and predictable. So we'll need a balance, and we'll need a balance over very large distances. In fact, it's going to take a, a national and an international grid to balance it, so that you know when the wind is not blowing in Shetland, the wind is blowing in Spain, <laughs> and when the uh, um, and when the sun is not, you know, when the sun is not shining in Germany, the the, the wave power is working in Scotland. It will it will it will need this kind of link up. Um, but it can certainly be done. Our calculations are that it can be done with the technology we have now, not with any advances, but with the technology we already have, that a million workers, uh, a million workers in 20 years can do, uh, can reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 86%. And our, um, our greenhouse gas emissions by 83%. That's in 20 years. In 30 years, we could reduce them by something like 95%. We could reduce them by 90% in 12 years if we had 2 million workers. <laughs> but we think that strains people's credibility, so we're saying a million workers. Um, the Quite a lot of those jobs will, as UCU keeps reminding us on the committees, uh, be jobs training people. <laughs> uh, because we're going to need an enormous amount of skills. But an awful lot of them will be really quite traditional, skilled manual work. In renewable energy, the main jobs are seafaring jobs, the kinds of jobs that people do out in the North Sea and so on, but even more factory jobs in, in making wind turbines and renewable energy. Enormous numbers of construction jobs, enormous numbers of jobs for bus drivers and for people on the railways. Now those jobs, we're clear on this in, 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 our, in our alliance, those jobs will have to be government jobs. The reason we say this is not ideological. We went back and forth, the first edition of this book, this is the third, the first edition, we went back and forth between the environmentalists in the campaign against climate change, many of them didn't like the idea of making all the jobs public sector. 
fact, having a national climate circus, like a national health circus. They didn't like it because ideologically, many of them are wedded to private industry, uh, to private business, rather. Um, and the trade unionists were all fine with it being a public sector, but what persuaded us in the end to come down with a public sector job is that we think we have to say to everybody who, do, uh, who will lose their job in a high carbon economy, oil tanker drivers, car salesmen, people like that, that we will guarantee them a job in the, uh, uh, a job in the new climate service. If we don't say that, we will utterly divide communities and we will utterly divide the trade union movement. So we have to say that, we have to mean it, and we have to stick with it. If we said it would be jobs in the private sector, you know, we'd retrain people for jobs in the private sector, everybody would know that was a lie. Right after the Myers strike, everybody knows that's not true. So we're saying it has to be public sector. Okay, how do we afford it? Well, here we come to, uh, there are two answers to how we can afford it. The first answer is it's not very expensive. I mean, it is on our calculation 66 billion pounds a year up front, which looks like a lot to you. But of that, we'll get about a third back. Um, in selling bus tickets and train tickets and electricity bills. <laughs> um, we won't get all of it back in that way because there have to be subsidies, but we'll get about a third of it back in that way. We're not simply digging holes. We're making things that produce things of value. Um, secondly, we'll get about a third of it back because when people uh, leave, uh, leave the dole and go into work, they pay a lot of taxes and they claim a lot less benefits. And that works out in about a third of it. That still leaves us, by our calculations, though, with 19 billion. Um, we've got seven different ways, outlined in here and in more detail than the technical stuff, seven different ways of raising that money. All of them are one form or another of taxing the wealth and the income of the 1%. Not because we don't like rich people. <laughs> Not for that reason. For a completely different reason, which is that we're trying to solve two problems here. We're trying to solve the environmental crisis we face, but we're also trying to solve the immediate economic crisis that we face. That means getting the economy moving again, getting people into jobs. If you tax people like us to raise the money, then we immediately don't spend the money on something else. And all the jobs that you're making, the new climate jobs you're making, the jobs are disappearing with the things we would have been spending the money on. But if you tax the wealth or the income of the 1%, which they are not spending, which they are putting under the cyber bed in a sense, if you, if you tax that, then that stimulates the economy. Um, okay, and for me, speaking as an environmentalist, I mean, I've been a trade unionist all my life, and I've been a climate campaigner only 11 years, but the... For me, the central thing that's really good about the idea of climate jobs is that it allows us climate is a difficult problem for several re to solve for several reasons, but one of them is that it's in the future. We can feel it now much more clearly, but it's still its real effects for most of us are in the future. Um, and that means that by the time we have built a big enough movement to stop it, it may be too late. Um, however, the economic crisis is on us now. I assume that everybody in this room knows somebody close to them who doesn't have a job, <laughs> needs a job, is quietly dying inside for not having that job. I think we can assume. Um, and so this is the reason why people might act now. But the other thing, do I have five minutes before I finish? The other thing is, it's a tactical thing. The, no, it's a strategic thing. The, the environmental movement has bought us the news of climate change <coughs> and blessed them, the environmental movement <coughs> and the science. They made it possible for humanity to do something about this. But, the environmental movement is a ghetto of, of, the, of the affluent, of the white, of the north, of all of those things. 
of the Pasha among us in the, uh, in the north. Um, that's a big enough ghetto probably to save the whales. It's not a big enough ghetto <clears throat> to do what we have to do about climate change. To solve the problem of climate change, we will need a mass, we will need mass movements because the governments are not going to do it unless they're absolutely forced for reasons we can come to. Um, to build, and to build that movement, the unions are going to be crucial. I mean, we all know around this table that the majority of people in Britain and other countries do not belong to unions <laughs> in the working class. But the unions can reach through the people, through our families, through our friends, through the people we know, the unions can reach all of society. Um, and that gives us a way to mobilize, but also a way to say to people, this is not about this is not about telling you what you're going to give up. This is about how things will be better for us. I want to end with two more things. I want you to come to the demonstration um, uh, Saturday week. I want you to bring everybody you can. I want you to come not because it's, it's an important demonstration. It's an important demonstration because the movement, the climate movement after Copenhagen, after this the sellouts of everything by every, every world leader in Copenhagen, um, except Bolivia. After that, the climate movement was enormously down. Now we're back. We had a demonstration between three and 400,000 people in New York City um, last, last autumn, in the most backward country <laughs> And we had that because of Hurricane Sam because Hurricane Sandy had hit New York, and, and, the, and the march looked like New York <laughs> in terms of the clothes they wore and the colors of their skin, and it looked like New York because it was the working class neighborhoods of color that Hurricane Sandy rolled straight into. Um, the fracking movement has made an enormous difference. We're back, and the movement is growing. The movement is much, much more radical, much more radical the last time we had in 2008, 2009. This is a radical demonstration. This is a demonstration for a million climate jobs, <laughs> um, explicitly for government action. We want it to be big, but also we have a moment now leading up to the talks in Paris in which we can create a mass movement. I, I don't want to say we're going to win this year, because we're not. This is a long fight. It's a long fight. It's the fight of a generation. And when I lie awake in bed at night, as I assume most of you have lain awake in bed at night and at some point thought, are we going to be able to stop this? Mm -hmm. I think my answer is still the odds are against us. That's the truth. But I now think much more strongly than I ever have before that we're in with a chance that it's possible that we can build the kind of movement which will allow you to solve this problem. So, please come on the demonstration. Please sell the booklet. Please <laughs> do all the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I ask the questions? But I'm only going to give you five minutes or so, not forever. So very. Clear questions, please, Tony. I would just like to um, thank um, the UCU headquarters for their contribution to climate change today <laughs> by uh, <laughs> trying to transform a North European late winter into a Mediterranean summer. <laughs> the other thing is we don't really need to, to worry that much because the um, UKIP environmental spokesperson mused in a public meeting the other day, what will we do when the renewables run out? <laughs>